wherever you have come from, wherever you're going, whatever you're going through, whether you are here in this space, whether you are joining us from elsewhere or else when, you are welcome here. All of you are welcome, and all of you, as in the fullness of who you are, is welcome in this place. There is nothing about ourselves that we need tone down, check at the door, lay aside in order to be here with our fullest selves. We are here to worship at Knox Metropolitan United Church, an affirming ministry in the heart of the city. In the sacred lands of Treaty 4 territory, the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. We are grateful to those who are supporting this service with gifts of music, voice, and song, heart, and the choir, and a special thanks to our soloist, Victoria, and to Jessica, who's providing our postlude on the organ. A special welcome to Hayden and Hayden's entourage as you join us for a time of celebrating the sacrament of baptism. A few things that are happening as part of the life and the work of Knox Metropolitan United Church that I will point out to you. Next Saturday, the 26th of November, is the next gathering of the parenting group that has been reading Sandbox Revolution, Raising Kids for a Just World. Um, and next week, Cecilia Rands, member here at Knox Met United Church, will be leading us in a conversation on the chapter from that book around uh, patriarchy and resisting gender roles in our families. Next Saturday as well, just to get here early for that, um, the sanctuary is being decorated for the Christmas season. And so if you're interested in coming to deck the halls, this one in particular, at 10 o'clock, we'll be gathering here. No level of expertise is needed, but if you have an interior decorating, design background, you are especially welcome. Next Sunday, the 27th, after worship, our Outreach and Social Action Ministry is convening a social justice potluck and round table, an opportunity to come and eat together, but also to lift up and name those issues of justice that we are concerned about as a community, that we are interested in learning more, and out of that to decide what might be priorities for this congregation as we seek justice. We are an affirming ministry, and we do acknowledge today as the Transgender Day of Remembrance. We have lit a candle, and later in our service, we will offer prayers along with trans siblings and other allies recognizing violence and continued challenges that our siblings experience in this way. This is also a reign of Christ Sunday. We carry many things within us. You'll find, uh, speaking of carrying many things within us, you may found that you're carrying a yellow insert in your bulletin. And these are some music notes from our music director, Hart Godden, about some of the music that's happening in this service, some exciting information about the organ that you'll be hearing shortly, as well as upcoming concerts that you can participate in in this beautiful space. Our opening hymn for those of us in this space is found in your red hymn books. For you who are joining us online, it is in your online liturgy. It is number 211, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
are able to remain standing, I'd invite you to do so and join with me in the words to a call for worship that are printed in our bulletin. This is a special prayer written for this, the Reign of Christ Sunday. We join together in the parts written for all. Mighty and tender God, the deep within all things, we enter now into your kingdom, your community of wholeness, your realm of peace. We bring our hunger and the hunger of our world. We bring our inner stranger and the exile of the world. We bring our fearful and hurting selves and the fear and hurt of the world. We open to healing. We open to hope. We open to peace. Amen and amen. Let us be seated. And we will take a moment to offer together as we are comfortable this prayer of centering and confession. We begin by breathing together. Or some of us begin by going to the corner and jumping up and down. A totally valid way to pray. We join as we are able. Christ, who we call sibling and Lord, beginning and end, known in Jesus at word made flesh, logos, hidden wholeness, pattern within chaos, wisdom calling from city streets for justice and compassion. Dare us to imagine integrity in our inner lives, our relationships, our planet, our institutions, and economic and political systems. Christ beyond all names, deepest mystery, depth of our own being, awaken us, enfold us, impel us to realize the dream that is ours to birth. We take a moment for our own reflection. And we continue as we are able. We dare to imagine the reign of Christ, love servant, your heart for an unfolding cosmos. Amen. Today we celebrate a baptism, and for that we're going to need some water. And for that, I'm going to need some help. I don't know if we have any of our younger worshipers who are here today who'd like to come and help me bless the water. Now, we've got some people who have done this a lot before, or even if you're a younger worshiper and you've never been here before and you'd like to help bless the water, um, you're welcome to come on up and join us over here. If you've never blessed anything before, fear not. The mechanics of it are reasonably easy. And for those of you in your seats, you're going to be part of this too, but just from where you are. So we have in front of us some colored cups. And I've got my rainbow stole. I wasn't able to get every color of the rainbow into our cups today. And, and it's, we use this for a few reasons. Number one, in our sacred stories, a rainbow is a sign of a promise. And one of the things that's happening today as part of the baptism is people are making promises. Promises to care for Hayden. Promises to support Hayden. Promises to love Hayden and, and to watch out for Hayden. And all of us, whether we know him really well, maybe we knew him since like the first day he arrived here, or some of us are meeting him for like the very, very first time. All of us get to be part of that promise. And we bless this water for, for a couple reasons. That way the water is full of all of the goodness we have to offer. And this water comes from a very special place. Like around the corner, there's a tap. And I just turned on the tap and I got the water, which is at once ordinary and amazing. It reminds us that God, that the holy things in life happen in the most ordinary of spaces. But it also reminds us there's a lot of places in our world, a lot of places even like really close to us where people can't just go to a tap and turn it on and find clean, healthy water. And it's a reminder of how precious that is and how we might pay attention to where and for whom that is lacking. So now to the blessing. You've got a cup in front of you. 
Excellent. And, and some people can, can you do like a double? You got a double? Yeah, du wonderful. Do you want to do a, do you have, do you have a double in you? Perfect. You're going to take your hand and you're going to put it over the cup. For you who are out there, if you'd like, you may stretch out your hand towards us up at the front here. And if you've never blessed anything before, this is what you do. You feel deep inside yourself and you find goodness and love and peace and whatever other word you might use for that goodness. And you feel it deep within. And we think about Hayden, whether we know him well or whether we're just meeting him. And we imagine that goodness rising up from within us and filling this water. And remember that, because we're going to do another blessing later. And we're going to pour this water from your cups into our basin here. A few months ago, we had a, a young baptismee, I think is the technical term, who's like three, who was really enthusiastic at this point, and so drank a cup of the blessed water. <laughs> kind of like, not just out here, let's get it right in there, which there's like some great theological thoughts we could go with in there. So if you folks want, we're going we're gonna to go to the front here, and you'll have a really good view, or you can head back to where you were seating before. There is size, some space on this side as well. And we're going to invite Liz to come to the microphone. And we're going to invite Hayden and family and godparents to come and join us over here. On behalf of the Congregation of Knox Metropolitan United Church, I am happy to welcome Hayden and all your whole family on this day of baptism. So we begin with some problems. You, you folks can come right up on here if you'd like. There were some good memes during the height of the pandemic of baptisms being done by super soakers, but we have not brought one today. So we are going to need a little bit of proximity. So we begin with some questions. And the first one is about a name. So Melissa and Tanner, by what name is this child to be known? It's a little one born to love, surrounded by love, a child of the universe and a child of God. At one with all that lives, you have been given in love the name Hayden Thomas Dunlop. May you take this name and make it your own. And may you live in freedom and fullness as you travel your journey of life. We come to that water that you helped us with before. We bless the humility of water, for water always takes the shape of whatever holds it. We bless the buoyancy of water, because water is stronger than the downward drag of gravity. We bless the innocence of water because it flows without thought of that which awaits us. For water is our voice of grief. Water is our cry of love in the flowing of our tears. And water is that vehicle of our inner voyage that keeps us alive. And so we bless water, who is our first mother. And Emma, would you like to help me pour the water? Okay, perfect. I'll hold this part. You, yep, perfect. Pour it up. Good job, and we'll do a little whoop and whoop. Amazing, thank you for your help. We come now to some promises. So Tanner, Melissa, and Emma, I invite you to respond to God's grace to Hayden by making these promises. Will you provide for Hayden a welcoming home of love and trust? And you respond, with God's help we will. Will you help Hayden grow an understanding and appreciation of faith? 
Will you encourage Hayden to reach out to others with love and compassion? Perfect. Excellent. And we've got some godparents. Nicole and Sean, you have been invited to play a special role both today and in the life of this family who loves you deeply. So will you help them to live into the promises they make today? And will you keep forever in your life, in your heart, a special place for Hayden? You say, with God's help, we will. Now to all of you who are gathered today, up here at the front and out there, wherever you are, I'm going to ask you a question. To all you who are gathered today, representatives of this congregation, Hayden's family and guests, as we gather around this font and this water, symbols of belonging and community, and as you witness the commitment these folks make today, will you pledge your care for them? Will you support them as they seek to understand and follow the unique way that life unfolds for them? We all say, with God's help, we will. So far, so good. We come now to the baptism, and I think you've got a special shell. And this shell has been used to baptize a few people here at the front. All right. So I'll have you keep holding Hayden, and we'll do it for here. Okay. So Hayden, in the touch of this water, a sign of inclusion and a sign of life, we baptize you into the love, joy, and service of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have done great. <laughs> and then Hayden, with the sign of the cross, you are marked as a beloved child of God. We all say, Amen. Okay. We now come to another blessing. So I'm going to lay my hand out here. We're going to invite Nicole and Sean to come around and Melissa and everyone. We're going to lay a hand out towards Hayden. And all you who are out there, you can stretch forth your hands as well. So Hayden, being born of water and the Spirit, may you creatively and lovingly witness to the miracle of life, the miracle of God. Amen. So Hayden Thomas Dunlop, into the household of faith we welcome you with joy and thanksgiving. We all say, Amen.
Now, you who are here at the front, I'm hoping that you'll help me with something before we go out. In a moment, our youngest worshipers um, are invited to head on out to a time of learning together. And, and Jenny, who's going to give a wave in a second, Jenny is our children and youth coordinator here, and she'll be taking our youngest worshipers out. So if you'd like, I'm going to invite you to stand with me for a second. because so we come to this point in the service where we share together peace. And... There once was a time where we'd reach out and we'd shake each other's hand, but we haven't been doing that for a couple of years as we've been kind of grappling with what it means to worship during the pandemic. And so we're going to pass peace using American Sign Language. So for folks who are up here at the front, you're going to help me teach this to everyone out there. So we take two hands like this, and if you want to do it with me, you can. We take two hands, we layer our hands across each other like this. So we've got our hands like this, then we kind of do them a little like flip, and then go down. So we have our hands, we go flip and down. This is an American sign for something is changing and becoming quiet, and that's a way to say peace. And then we take those hands that are down, and we kind of flip them up and point them, and we share that all around. This is a way of saying, be with you. And then we put up a thumb, we put up a finger, call someone to tell you they love them, and then you point the thumb at yourself, pinky finger at someone else. And we point and we say, and also with you. It's a good reminder because sometimes we like to offer goodness out there and we sometimes remember that we need to be open to receive it ourselves. So we're gonna share peace. So we need to make sure, we, Lily, you got, you got someone's looking at the choir. We got some people looking out here. Make sure someone's looking at the camera so we can share peace with everyone who's watching. So dear friends, wherever you have come from, wherever you are going and whatever you are going through, may the peace of Christ be with you all and also with you. Amen. And so friends, as our younger worshipers head on out with Jenny for a time of learning and growing together, the rest of us in this place will be singing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, number 334.
Would you please join me in the prayer of understanding as printed in the bullet? Spirit of the living God, turn on the light of truth and wake up our hearts by the words we now declare and ponder. In ancient stories, let us find fresh life, fresh hope, and fresh courage for witness in your world. Amen. A reading from the Hebrew Scriptures, the prophet Jeremiah. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says Yahweh. Therefore, thus says the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherds my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them, so I will attend to you for your evil doings. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I shall raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says God. The days are surely coming, says Yahweh, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called, Yahweh is our righteousness.
A reading from the Christian scriptures from the book of Matthew. When the Son of Man, the human one, comes in glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you that are blessed by God, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And then when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of these, these to these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of these of these, you, not, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. May God's blessing be upon these and all words spoken and pondered here this morning. Amen.
We are grateful for the gifts of music, voice, and song that enrich our worship. On calling Jesus Lord in a pluralistic worldview, while trying to avoid being super sessionist. For those of us who find ourselves in the Christian tradition, we embody a faith that emerged in a world that was very different from the one in which we live. And so I think we're implored to ask how the forms and the words and the texts and the traditions of that faith relate to the world we live in now. How it responds to the questions of that world, to the needs of that world, and how it invites us to understand what is our obligation to that world. And I'm really conscious of that today, given the texts we've heard and, and now think about it. But first, I want to invite you to think about something else with me. If I were to go and stand in the center of the pedestrian mall on 12th Avenue this afternoon, or maybe to wander over in front of Mosaic Stadium with all the Grey Cup festivities and hold up a big old sign that said, Jesus is the King, or Jesus is Lord, I wonder how I might be received. I have a feeling that the people who pass by might make certain assumptions about me. Certain assumptions about my political leanings or my views on particular social issues. And if I paused and invited you to chat with the person beside you, I have a feeling you could come up with a generally pretty good list. I thought about putting a little ballot underneath your pews to ask if I should actually do that or what I should put on the sign instead, but I just ran out of post-it notes, friends. I'm sorry. Today, the church celebrates what we call Reign of Christ Sunday, or sometimes Christ the King Sunday. And, and interestingly enough, Reign of Christ Sunday falls on Grey Cup Sunday, or perhaps vice versa, pretty regularly, which I think is kind of interesting, because if I was to hold up a sign in the middle of the Grey Cup festivities saying, Jesus is Lord, perhaps one of the assumptions you might make about me is that I was a person who believed that my religion was better than someone else's religion, or perhaps better than everyone else's religion, not entirely unlike making a claim about which sports team was more likely to win the sports game this afternoon. You might think that I was arguing for a universal objective truth and, and that I wanted other people to think like me. So then, if that's not what we think, what do we, who find ourselves as part of a Christian tradition, but who hold that in a pluralistic way, but by which I mean a Christian tradition that honors and acknowledges the validity, the beauty, the wisdom, and the inspiration in other faiths and other philosophical paths? What then do we do on a day that calls itself Christ the King? or Reign of Christ Sunday. What do we do with a declaration that's pretty central to the Christian tradition, that declaration that Jesus is Lord? I mean, do we say that? And if we say it, what do we mean when we say it? And I think this is an interesting way to think about our readings, because we heard from Matthew a very classic Christ the King Sunday reading. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon a throne of glory. The nations will be gathered before him. The king will say to those in his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by God, to inherit the kingdom prepared for you. There's lots of kingly language. There's lots of reign-y language. There's lots of imagery. It's very in line with some of the lyrics of the hymns we've sung thus far today. And like classic depictions of Jesus sitting on a throne or sitting with a gigantic crown fits really well with the beginning of this reading. But then it ends with a twist. Because it ends with Jesus identifying himself not with thrones, not with crowns, not with angels, but with those who suffer with those who lack. So what does it mean to call Jesus Lord when Jesus identifies himself with those who hunger and those who suffer? And we're going to come back to that. 
because we also heard from the Hebrew scriptures, the prophet Jeremiah. The days are surely coming when I will raise up from David a righteous branch who shall reign as the, reign as the king. So we got our reign, we got our king. We've got two of our boxes checked. Now the lectionary, and the lectionary means the, the readings that are chosen for each Sunday. It takes a piece of the Hebrew scriptures and, and the Christian scriptures and, and places them alongside each other, perhaps to read them in conversation with one another. And a pretty standard Christian interpretation of this line from Jeremiah is that the king who is promised is Jesus. The days are surely coming when I will raise up from David a righteous branch and he shall reign as the king and deal wisely. He shall execute justice and righteousness in the land and by this name he shall be called. Yahweh is our righteousness. Now this is often how Christian theology reads the Hebrew scriptures. Christian theology has classically interpreted the Hebrew scriptures to be about predicting or foretelling the coming of Jesus. But here's the problem. The book of Jeremiah is not only read in churches. The book of Jeremiah is read in synagogue. Jeremiah is the first of the latter prophets of the Nevi'im, the second part of Tanakh, the Jewish scripture. So what does Judaism think of this tendency within Christianity to say these prophetic texts are actually about our guy, about Jesus being the Messiah, the King of David's line who will bring righteousness. Now this, and if you were wondering about the sermon title, this is called supersessionism, which is a word that will score you 19 points in Scrabble plus a bonus 50 if you use all of your tokens. It incidentally has way too many letters to fit on your Scrabble board. But it refers to a Christian teaching that Jesus is the completion of that which is left incomplete in Judaism, or that somehow the Christian church is the fulfillment of what is promised in what is called the Old Testament. It's sometimes called fulfillment theology, and I'd like to say that it's deeply problematic, because that idea fails to realize and recognize Judaism as complete in and of itself. And this idea, these ideas, this way of reading scripture has been deeply tied to anti-Semitism. And it has been used as justification for Christian nations to mistreat Jewish communities for thousands of years, at least 2,000 of them. And even in a liberal tradition that honors Judaism, that theology can be lurking in places we might not think. I mean, if you heard the Jeremiah scripture and thought that's about Jesus, that's okay. We've, we've kind of, if we've been raised in a church, been led to believe that or cultured perhaps to believe that. Now, often Christian anti-Semitism is really obvious around Easter when problematic Christian teachings arise that say things like the Jews crucified Jesus. And, and we know how to counter that in our churches. We, we speak against that. And if you've never heard that, please feel fi find us on the website and download an Easter sermon. We can show that there. But we're coming to a time of year where this stuff really starts to spring up. But it springs up in a kind of a more subtle way. And the challenge is, it, is that it comes in a really nostalgic way as well that sometimes makes it hard for us to recognize. So I want to take this opportunity to name it so we can think about it. Before I come back to Jeremiah's words, I want to use a more recognizable example. In, in a few weeks from now and then a few weeks after that, Handel's Messiah will be performed in the sanctuary. It's going to be performed three times between now and Christmas. And many may come and attend. Probably many will be involved in singing it. And I, and I asked around some friends who sing it. And, and one of the highlights for many people is right at the end of scene two. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And anyone recognizing? Is perhaps, perhaps some of us can even hear Handel's version of this playing in our minds. And if not from Handel, you might recognize it from our Christmas Eve re readings and, and Bill Johnson over there with the awe-filled voice reading that beautiful passage on Christmas Eve at the candlelight service is, is one of the highlights of my year. 
But if I asked you about who are those words written, who, who are they sung about, who are they spoken about, I think I know what you might think. And I'm not going to ask you to say it out loud because I'm guessing few of us are going to answer, well, they're written about Hezekiah ben Ahaz, the king of Judah, who reigned when Jerusalem was under siege by the Assyrian army in 701 before the Common Era. That was a siege that was ultimately unsuccessful. But it happened, it was a deeply hopeful moment. And, and you remember that solo, the beautiful solo that Victoria sang earlier, the words were printed in your bulletin, let war in the world pass swiftly and be done with, that it may bring us the comforts of peace from the ends of the earth. This would be very apt to the moment in which Isaiah is writing. His people lived between the superpowers of Assyria, Egypt, and Babylon, and the possibility that God would deliver them from these warring forces and these marching armies and give them peace, this was hugely comforting. And so for a Christian theology to say, well, that's actually, that's about Jesus. Perhaps we can see the trouble here. Now, depending on where our background is in religion, it might be shocking to hear it suggested that the Old Testament, which I prefer to call the Hebrew scriptures, wasn't actually written to point towards the new, and that these words weren't actually written to predict Jesus. Reverend Michelle Voss, the outgoing president of Emmanuel College Seminary in Toronto, writes this. Over the centuries, far too many Christian interpreters thought that the Jewish people were being stubborn by refusing to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah. This mistaken belief continues in the present day and ignores the reality that Jesus himself has a Jewish identity. Now, we can give Handel a pass. This interpretation was existing for well over a thousand years before he wrote Messiah. And we are still going to read Isaiah on Christmas Eve. I'm not saying we jettison the whole idea, but I'm inviting us to carry it with some nuance. Because there is a way for Christians to see Jesus in this text without erasing or invalidating a Jewish reading. And that way leads us to honoring that we share sacred texts and we respect the autonomy and integrity of other traditions and actually bring the two into a really interesting conversation. Because the first followers of Jesus were Jewish. And Jesus himself may have been called Yeshua ben Miriam, Jesus, child of Mary. And to them, they saw something in Jesus that was so significant that when they sought to express it, they used the most effective means they knew, their own tradition. But they weren't trying to offer a new interpretation to replace the old, because that's not how sacred text works. Sacred text speaks to us uniquely from where it was written to the moment we find ourselves. The truth of the matter is there are moments in which we long to see one who brings peace come again and again and again. And when we see that, we are full of hope and we celebrate. See, it wasn't for several centuries that Christianity would seek to make claims of ultimate truth. And this means today Christians can read these texts without claiming them exclusively for our own or arguing over who is or isn't the Messiah. And if you've ever watched Life of Brian by Monty Python, you know that arguing over who or is or is not the Messiah is not getting you anywhere helpful. So if these passages are about expressing a longing for a world where things that are wrong are made right. And it allows us to imagine a longing for our own moment. Well, when we read Jeremiah against Matthew, we get a really different thing. Remember that in that text, Jesus is telling a story that begins with great majesty, crown him with many crowns. Like That's like the beginning of that story. There's glory, there's thrones, there's angels, and then there's this. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Now, is the writer of Matthew claiming that sometime way in the future, Jesus is going to come and judge all the people? I don't think so. 
I think what this is telling us is that those who first encountered Jesus' presence and teaching felt like that judgment from some day off was somehow present in their morning, in their moment. Because a Jewish understanding of judgment isn't about eternal reward or punishment. It is about showing us the truth of the moment we are in. There's a famous quote attributed to Gandhi that wasn't actually said by Gandhi, but it's a good one. The true measure of any society can be found in how it treats the most vulnerable within it. What if that's how we read Jesus in this passage from Matthew? As a way to look more closely and to better understand ourselves. Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry? And when did we give you food? When were we thirsty and you, we gave you something to drink? When were you a stranger and we welcomed you? When were you naked and we clothed you? Truly I tell you, whenever you did this to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Again, what if this is not meant to be read as a prediction of the future, but as a way to understand our present? Not about reaching eternal reward or avoiding eternal punishment, but exposing the truth about ourselves, whether that is understood communally or individually. A challenge to take stock to ask ourselves what is our obligation to the world and to the moment we find ourselves, and to fuel a longing for the world made right. What does it mean to read this passage on Reign of Christ Sunday? What do we put on our sign out front the gray cup in the light of this sort of thing? Does devotion to Jesus ask us to build kinship with those way outside of our comfort? For just as you did this to one of the least of these who are a member of my family. Do these words open up for us more questions than they answer and ask us to think about our obligation and what is our role in making another world possible? May we think these things deep in our hearts and live them out in our every day. Amen. Our hymn is number 248, When Long Before Time.
In prayer, we bring an offering of our deepest selves. In our prayers, we bring our joys and our hopes. We bring our concerns and our sorrows. And we hold these together, somehow finding them as one. As we pray, we begin in silence. And in silence, we each bring to mind our prayers for self, for the people we love, the communities we are a part of in this world that we share. In silence, let us pray. respond to our prayers. God of love, hear our prayers. God of love, hear our prayers, whether they be for things that we are going through, alone or with others, whether they are big questions or great, grateful thoughts. Hear our prayers. Whether our prayers are for those we know well or those we have only seen from afar. Whether our prayers are for moments of harmony or moments of discord, whether our prayers fill us with hope or whether we offer prayers through gritted teeth, wondering whether the worst is yet to come. O God of love, hear our prayers. And on this day of the Transgender Day of Remembrance, we offer this prayer by Rabbi Reuben Zelman. O God of mercy, bless the souls of all those who are in our hearts on this day of remembrance. We call to mind the young and the old of every race, faith, and gender expression who have died by violence. Those who would not hide or did not pass or stood too proud Today, we name them reluctant activists, fiery hurler of heels, warriors for quiet truth, the one whom no one knew. As many as we can name, there are thousands more who we cannot, and for those for whom no Kaddish has been said. We mourn their senseless deaths while giving thanks for their lives, their teachings, and the glow of each holy flame. We pray for the strength to carry legacies of vision, bravery, and love. As we remember them, we resolve to root out the injustice, ignorance, and cruelty that grows despairs. And we pray, O oh God, that those who perpetrate hate and violence will come to understand that creation has many faces, many genders, each a holy expression. Blessed are they who have allowed their divine light, their divine image to shine in this world. Blessed are they whom no light will extinguish. And now we pray words Jesus taught friends and followers both. For as a child turns to her mother, knowing that she is heard and knowing that she is seen, we turn to God and we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, we have been welcomed to this place in peace, and we go forth from this place to love and to serve. And as we go, our closing hymn this morning is number 330, Jesus Shall Reign.
So dear beloved ones, as you go forth from here, may gates of domination unlatch into fields of liberation, that all may step out into the fresh air of salvation for our efforts to co-create kingdom of earth are blessed by the living Christ. They are breathed upon by the mystery of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, go in love, and go with God who goes with us.